Thank you all so much for joining us today for our webinar on occupational exposure and ventilation assessments in New York City nail salons. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we're just going to give it another minute for people to finish logging on and then we'll get started. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, on behalf of education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series, offering free webinars the second Tuesday of each month. This collaborative effort is on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program and aspires to pr provide free access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Today's webinar, Occupational Exposure and Ventilation Assessment in New York City Nail Salons, is brought to you by the New York, New Jersey Occupational Safety and Health Center and Dr. Brian Havilanis. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address questions. All participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive a link to the recording and evaluation form tomorrow around 12 p.m. Pacific. This evaluation will qualify participants for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Once completed, you will be able to access your certificate. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the COEH Northern California's YouTube page and on our website. At this time, we're pleased to welcome our presenter. Dr. Brian Pavilanis is a certified industrial hygienist who has been working in occupational health and exposure science since 2012. He joined the CUNY SPH faculty in 2014 as an associate professor. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Rutgers University in the exposure science division and earned his PhD at the University of Iowa in industrial hygiene in 2012. At CUNY XPH, Dr. Pavilanis has developed and taught courses in industrial hygiene, noise and radiation, and industrial ventilation. In 2016, he was named Industrial Hygiene Program Director for the New York, New Jersey NIOSH Education and Research Center. His research aims to understand human exposure in the occupational environment and to characterize risk due to exposure. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for logging in uh, to Zoom. Uh, so let's just get started. So the objectives of this lecture are to describe exposure and months and symptoms of unworkers, workers. Review new regulations implemented by New York State to control exposures. And then finally, develop strategies to measure exposures in nail salons. Now, this presentation will cover uh, two research studies I conducted in New York uh, City, uh, looking at both the exposure and ventilation in nail salons. Now, there are a lot of nail salons in New York City. So we have almost 2,000 nail salons in New York alone, and 800 nail salons in Manhattan alone. So when we were conducting uh, these two studies, you know, we would actually fly out and walk around New York City um, to recruit nail salons. And, you know, Manhattan, you can probably walk uh, about six hours uh, north to south. And, you know, we could walk every block in Manhattan and basically come upon a nail salon. So we have all the salons recruit from in New York City. It's a big industry. And the next slide I'll show you uh, is a map from the New York Times. It's showing just the density of lawns. We have almost 27,000 workers in the New York City metropolitan area that work in nail salons. And this is likely, so we probably have more workers than 27,000. 
I mean, just, you know, think about that number. I mean, that's a fairly substantial number of workers. You know, while we have a lot of, you know, traditional industry and manufacturing within New York City, we have a lot of service employees that have real occupational exposure. It's not often considered. Now, in New York City, uh, these nail salons are a significant uh, source of employment for uh, recent immigrants from both Korea and China. Um, those are the predominant uh, immigrant communities where a lot of nail salon workers uh, work and come from. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, Nepalese and Vietnamese uh, workers in nail salons. Now, most of these workers have limited English language skills and employment options. So, you know, if there is occupation, you know, high occupational exposures within the nail salons, you know, they don't have the same uh, recourse to, you know, leave that employment. And go so, so it, it's it's hard, um, you know, to control those, to work with the nail salons, to control the exposures and make sure the workers are safe. Uh, so this was a, you know, map from uh, the New York Times looking at uh, the nail salons with the cities. And you could see just the amount of nail salons in New York City alone, in the New York area, in the top left of the slide. Um, said, you know, you could walk around Manhattan and basically every block find a nail salon. Um, you know, the next largest area is Boston, San Francisco, Los Angeles. They only have about half the number of nail salons that New York City has. So what does the nail salon industry look like? So, you know, long hours. So, you know, traditionally in industrial hygiene, you know, we figure an eight hour work day, five days a week. That's not the nail salon industry. So you have a lot of workers that work eight to 10 hours, um, more than five days a week. Um, so, you know, those traditional occupational exposure limits that kind of build in uh, time for clearance, you know, over the weekend, when they night, uh, that may not necessarily be the same uh, for nail salon workers because they're working uh, longer extended shifts without that time. Uh, you know, as I said before, uh, most nail technicians are recent immigrants. There's a hierarchical structure within that nail salon. And, you know, the nail technicians' health and safety concerns may be ignored uh, by management or the worker may be fearful of reprisal. Um, so workers in nail salons are exposed to a myriad of chemicals. And applying those traditional industrial hygiene techniques may be challenging because you're not dealing with, you know, one exposure, a couple exposures. You might be at hundreds of VOC exposures within that nail salon. And you can see the chemicals commonly found in nail salons. Uh, you have engines, endocrine disruptors, um, sensitizers, so in artificial nails. Uh, they use uh, methacrylates, and those can be sensitizers. Uh, additionally, you have exposure to dust, and that dust can be from you know, the shaping of artificial nails or traditional nails, and you can have this indoor air chemistry where you have secondary formation of ultra particles. Additionally, you know, one issue that might be overlooked, uh, especially maybe by the industrial hygienists, so we're not usually typically looking at urban issues, is uh, ergonomics. So um, I'll show you a slide coming up. The prevalence of ergonomic issues in nail salons is just as much as your respiratory issues. So when you're looking at Exposures on a chemical by chemical uh, basis, you're going to find almost all exposures in the nail salons are much smaller than your tradition and then your occupational exposure limits. So even using your most conservative uh, TLVs, you're going to find order of magnitude, multiple orders of magnitude uh, between what the actual exposure is and uh, your exposure limit. You know, I think the one except that would be formaldehyde. Uh, you know, as you know, formaldehyde is a pretty low TLV. Uh, but outside of formaldehyde, which may be through secondary formation, 
or maybe coming from outdoor air, you know, maybe not actually coming from the nail salon, the vast majority of your come well below your occupational exposure limits. However, as you know, we'll, I'll show you, I think in the next slide, you have the hundreds of actual chemicals that a worker is exposed to. So, you know, looking at there's, you know, chemical by chemical uh, basis, really ignores both the additive and potentially synergistic health effects of the exposure. And again, you know, the nail salon worker, they're not working eight hours, five days a week. They're working extended hours that doesn't allow for uh, clearance times. So uh, this is a table and actually if, uh, I'll show you later on uh, where this came from in my publication. Uh, but I reviewed uh, more than five uh, different exposure assessment studies conducted in the U.S. And you could see the range of exposures compared to that TLV. Um, so your exposures on the left side uh, in nail salons, you could see at least an order of two difference, mostly more uh, between what the actual exposure is and the TLV. So again, uh, workers are exposed to that mixture of very low level uh, contaminants. But even if there, you know, if you look at, you know, the exposure compared to the occupational exposure limit, you know, a big difference, we are seeing health effects in nail salons. And that has been fairly consistent over a number of different studies. So uh, I have on the slide here, this was uh, from uh, a colleague of mine uh, is doing work out in Boston. Uh, this was from an earlier study, so from 2008. So she was one of the first uh, researchers to look at uh, exposure to salons and health effects among the workers. So you can see the different types of health effects that uh, workers reported. Uh, this is all supported uh, symptoms. Uh, but over 44% uh, had at least one respiratory symptom, and that would usually go away after the worker left for the day, okay? Um, additionally, workers uh, complained of dermal problems, and again, muscular skeletal problems was also highly reported. So 46% of the workers in this study, and it was a study of 71 uh, Vietnamese workers in Boston, uh, complained of muscular skeletal problems, okay? So, you know, just, you know, applying our traditional industrial hygiene techniques, you might find, okay, well, these workers are well below any sort of occupational exposure limit, but we're not seeing that um, when you actually do symptom surveys. Workers are complaining of respiratory problems, uh, dermal problems uh, from exposures within the salon. And while this study did not specifically look at uh, collecting assessment measurements, uh, they asked the workers to, you know, rate the air quality uh, or the amount of fresh air within the nails. And what they found was that workers that had, that said that the air quality within the salon was bad, uh, reported significantly more respiratory uh, issues. Now, uh, this next study actually was much more uh, objective um, medical assessment. So this study was performed by NIOSH, uh, and it, it was a study of nail technicians, lung function, and airway inflammation. Uh, so they recruited nail techs and cosmetology students, and they matched that with control subjects. Now, you know, doing nail salon research, uh, you realize that, it, you know, it's challenging to recruit uh, participants for your study. So this study actually sent out letters to over 7,000 nail salon techs who were able to enroll 51. So it's a challenging population to recruit from and, you know, participate in research studies. But what this study did find was that uh, nail techs, uh, that worked with uh, methacolates, which are sensitized, 
uh, had increased airway inflammation and decreased pulmonary function. And this increased with job latency. So kind of, you know, taking it now to New York uh, City State, um, in 2015, a series of investigative reports uh, from the New York Times described the nail industry in New York. And this was a series of, I believe it was three articles, you know, they covered everything in uh, the nail salon world. So it wasn't just health and safety, but it talked about wage theft and other issues. Uh, but there was a, a big piece about uh, health and safety among nail salon workers. Now, this led in uh, 2000 to New York State implementing new health and safety requirements in nail salons, okay? And I'll, I'll show you uh, in the next few slides what they were, but it's specifically uh, mandated to implement a specific ventilation requirement in there. Now, you know, going through, you know, all the nail salons, you know, doing the recruitment and talking to salon owners, you know, I would say my impression of, you know, the salon owner's opinion about these regulations are, they are concerned. I mean, they, the salon managers, the owners, they work in the nail salons. Um, they understand that they don't feel well sometimes going home at night. They're concerned about their own health and safety. However, you know, one of those that they complained about was there hasn't been a lot of guidance from New York State. So they're given all these ventilation requirements, they're unsure how to implement it. You know, New York City, you're dealing with much smaller salons. You don't own the building. You don't, you know, you might be in a high rise on the lowest floor. You know, it's challenging to make all these structural changes to your nail salon as opposed to, you know, being out in the suburbs or some other area. You know, they're worried about how can they implement these laws that New York State enacted. But at the same time, they are concerned about their own safety. So these were uh, the ventilation requirements that New York State had. So there was two different uh, requirements. There was a requirement for your general exhaust ventilation, and local exhaust ventilation. So for the general exhaust ventilation, they must have 20 cubic feet per minute of outdoor air per person, uh, plus an additional outdoor air requirement for uh, your square footage. Addition, and this is what nail salons are most concerned about, is at every chair, at um, every uh, you know, pedicure, they must have local exhaust ventilation. And that local exhaust ventilation must exhaust uh, 50 cubic feet per minute uh, at that station, okay? And in order to be in compliance with the law, you must exhaust uh, that air directly and the exhaust must be turned on at all day, okay? So nail salons license before October 2016, uh, like before they were built, uh, they would need to actually comply with the law now, okay? So 2016, obviously. So they have to already be complying with the law now. Now, nail salons that were built prior to October 2016 have until October 2021 to comply with the law. So they still have another year and a little bit uh, to get their uh, mission uh, up to the New York State requirements. Now I can say after visiting three to 400 nail salons um, in 2019, none of these salons have complied. There is absolutely no salon that I walked into that I saw local exhaust ventilation uh, in New York City. And I really haven't found any salon uh, at all that was, you know, built prior to me uh, that was being, uh, that would have to have the local exhaust ventilation system that was licensed uh, after October 2016 to also have local exhaust 
information system. So this is a, uh, a photo from uh, New York State, and they're showing the salon, you know, what the local exhaust ventilation system looks like. And, you know, this is why salon owners are concerned about, you know, installing these LED systems. Uh, so, you know, for one thing, they're worried about the construction costs. So, you know, nail funds operate on a, you know, pretty small profit margin. Uh, rent is extremely high in uh, New York City, especially you know, Manhattan. So they're concerned about one, okay, so we have to, you know, now install these local exhaust ventilation systems and our soul is going to have, you know, a startup cost associated with it. Also, you know, we're, we're not dealing with a whole lot of space in Manhattan. So in one salon, it was 3,000 square feet and it had 10 uh, manicure and pedicure stations in there, okay? So they may not even have the space to, you know, put these LED systems in. Uh, and if they need, they have that space, they would have to remove a station, okay? So again, that's going to cost money. And it does cost money to, you know, continually uh, exhaust air. So they're also worried about that as well. Okay, so here would be an idealized version of the nail salon. Um, I didn't see salons that look like this, uh, but this would be their idealized version from New York State. So you have one uh, exhaust system, exhaust here, and that's exhausting the air directly outside, okay? And your makeup air is coming either from infiltration or from your HVAC system, okay? And then you're gonna have your local exhaust stations at each one of the manicure and pedicure stations uh, that exhaust air directly outside. Now again, these owners you know, do not uh, own the building. They may be in a high rise, so like the lowest level in a high rise. So you know, there's concerns about you know, how can I you know, have all these systems exhausting air directly outside. Um, you know, how do I tie that into my ventilation system? So there's somewhat confusion from the salon owners in uh, New York City about implementing uh, this new law. Okay, so I started this project uh, back in the summer of 2017. Um, so we did two studies. Uh, we collected uh, exposure and ventilation measurements in 2017 and 2018, and this resulted in two different papers. So I'm gonna present the results uh, of these. Now, all our studies were, as I said, conducted in New York City, uh, mainly in Manhattan. Uh, in the second study, we did recruit salons in Brooklyn, and in the first study, we had one salon in the Bronx and one in Queens. But for the most part, these were you know, salons located in Manhattan. Now, the overall aim of this was to collect, um, you know, baseline measurements uh, before the law was implemented and then after the law is implemented to, you know, compare, you know, now that we have, um, you know, a, a, a public health uh, new law implemented, do we see reduction in exposure within these nail salons? However, I'm unsure if actually any salons will be able to comply by 2021, you know, especially with the pandemic. So we wanted to collect baseline indoor air quality uh, measurements. We also still wanted to see, you know, how the salons were doing with their ventilation. You know, are they close to being able to implement this? Are they currently, you know, meeting the uh, no exhaust ventilation requirements? Uh, so in order to do this, we measured uh, total volatile organic compounds, uh, TVOCs, uh, carbon dioxide, and in the second study, we measured uh, three chemicals of interest, uh, homothacolate, uh, toluene, and ethyl acetate. So this first study uh, was published in 2017 in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health. Uh, 
And really for this first, this was the first study actually in New York City to look at um, indoor air quality, um, you know, industrial hygiene exposures within New York City. So this was uh, the first, even though that we have so many salons uh, in New York City. So at first, you know, we were sure if we could even do this. Uh, so it was also looking at, you know, feasibility. Would salons be interested in participating in this study? So the goal of the study was to assess temporal and spatial trends in TVOC situations, understand how general exhaust ventilation uh, mitigates exposure, and help inform any sort of exposure assessment studies. So we wrapped up the study about three and again, it focused mainly in salons located in Manhattan. Now I will say, I think this study was, you know, did suffer from, you know, some biases, you know, this was a convenience sample. So, you know, we actually went to almost 300 salons, but we were only able to 10. Um, and a lot of the salons that did participate tended to be more high end. Um, I think in our second study, we were able to recruit more nail salons that were indicative of New York City. Uh, but this study, you know, a lot of the more high-end salons uh, did seem to participate this in the study uh, compared to just your regular nail salons. So as I said, you know, we visited close to nail salons. Uh, for the most part, we didn't get a lot of refusals. Uh, only nine actually refused to participate. Uh, in 150 salons, drop off a flyer. We'd come in with a flyer, explain the study, leave business cards, sometimes show instrumentation. Uh, 50 salons didn't have a manager uh, or owner present, so we just would leave the flyer there and they didn't follow up. Uh, 95, they said they would think about it, um, again, but never got back to us. So. All said and done, we were able to recruit 10 salons, but we visited about 300 salons. But as I said previously, this is, you know, it's a difficult uh, industry to recruit from. So in order to look at the spatial variability, uh, what, we, what we did was we, uh, we set up two uh, sampling stations. So in this first study, we only measured uh, TVOCs uh, using a PID and uh, an quality uh, meter, uh, and specifically looking at uh, carbon dioxide. So we would set up two different stations, uh, one in manicure station or section and one in the pedicure station. And for the study, we only looked at on a weekday um, measurement day uh, within the nail salons, okay? So we would usually go uh, to the salon uh, early morning, uh, set up our stations, and allow it to data log uh, throughout the day, and then come and up uh, the instrumentation later on. So uh, for all the nail salons, we sampled about six to 12 hours, depending if we could actually get into the salon, meet with the manager and set up for the day. Uh, but we you know, would sample during the, the, you know, the high volume time within the salon. So as you might be familiar with as an industrial hygienist, uh, we use the PID to look at TVOC exposure, and we use the PID with a 10.6 uh, electron volt lamp in there, okay? So, you know, you know, the pros and cons with the PID, I mean, it's good for looking at your temporal trends in the data. You're not going to be able to get with that with a passive monitor. Uh, however, you know, it's going to react eventually to all the different chemicals within the nail slot here. So I have uh, on this slide on the right side, you could see the different chemicals found in nail salons. 
And you could see if the PID is going to respond, uh, overestimate the concentration or underestimate the concentration. So realistically, you know, what type of data you're getting with the PID is more qualitative in nature. So you can look at a salon and see if it's you know, poor indoor air quality or good indoor air quality, but you're never really going to understand the exact composition of the chemicals within the nail salon. It's definitely a, you know, a uh, limitation of this work. Uh, but I thought it was really important to understand both the spatial and trends uh, within the nail salons. Now I'll say due to my own uh, naivety uh, with, you know, making these general exhaust ventilation measurements, you know, I thought, well, I'd, you know, go up to the exhaust with my, you know, bolometer, make that quick measurement and be done with the day. Um, I will say it was quite challenging getting a bolometer on New York City subways to go to different nail salons. Um, but, you know, we, we tried that with the first couple of salons. And, you know, what we found was uh, a lot of salons did not have a dedicated general exhaust, uh, you know, ventilation. What they would do is, you know, bring that outdoor air uh, only from their HVAC system. So they would have, you know, multiple exhaust vents throughout the salon. Uh, they also, you know, we would go in with our equipment um, during when they had customers in there. So we sold this study and them participating in the study is, you know, limited intrusion on their business. Um, you know, we're not gonna make a lot of uh, ruckus. We're gonna, you know, be in and out, set up our equipment and leave. Um, you know, won't really know we're there. So it was very challenging to actually go out and try to measure their ventilation, um, especially as 20 foot ceilings, we need a ladder, we're trying to you know, bring down a subway. Um, so we just found that just using your traditional industrial hygiene, uh, you know, methods for ventilation just would not work. You know, ideally to measure the outdoor airflow, we would go to the exhaust and just, you know, measure the amount of exhaust. Uh, but the, like I said, these nail salons are in rented buildings. Uh, they might not have access uh, to their HVAC system. Also maybe on the roof, which on a high rise, we may not have access to. So it just really made this, you know, a challenging to actually go out and measure um, their general exhaust ventilation. And as you can see, like, you know, so their, uh, you know, ducts, 20 foot, non-standard size. So it, it would just be too challenging to actually go out and measure on just using our equipment. So what we did was we estimated uh, the amount of outdoor airflow using this ASTM equation, okay? So the nail salons had a requirement of 20 CFM of outdoor airflow per person, plus an additional space requirement. Um, if uh, the occupant density was unknown, you could use 25 CFM per person um, as a de default value. So that's what we use for this to determine if they were in compliance with the law. So using this equation here and looking at uh, the CO2 generation per person and 400 ppm of CO2 uh, outside, if a nail salon was in compliance uh, with this law, they should not exceed 850 parts per million of CO2, okay? So we kind of, you know, back calculate in this equation to estimate whether or not they were, you know, meeting this general exhaust ventilation requirement. So, you know, I said uh, before uh, that, you know, one of the aims of the study was to look at, you know, both the general trend, but and spatial uh, variability. So you can see, uh, so we would, you know, sample on the pedicure station, then also the manicure station. There was not a lot of variability throughout the day um, at those two areas in the salon. 
So, you know, because the generation sources are fairly uniform uh, throughout the salon, uh, also the ventilation, well mixed room within the salon here. So really the magnitude of difference is, you know, quite small and probably within, you know, uh, the air instrumentation here. Uh, the one exception to this uh, was a very, very small salon. Um, the salon also kind of doubled as a convenience store. Uh, so people would come in and buy things. And then also there was a section that had, um, you know, a section where you can get manicures or pedicures. Uh, for the most part, they only did artificial nails and manicures. So it was definitely different compared to any other salon that we measured um, and did the exposure assessment in. So outside of that, at every salon seemed to really indicate uh, that you have a you know, fairly well mixed room with uh, generation sources uh, scattered throughout the salon fairly evenly. Uh, here of TVOC concentrations, again, uh, by this target of 850 parts per million of CO2. So uh, that salon uh, was above the target of 850. So, you know, they were not meeting those ventilation requirements. Or if it was below 850, meaning they were meeting the general exhaust ventilation requirements uh, during that time of the day. And over uh, TVOC concentrations average 32 parts per million uh, during times when that target was uh, met, or excuse me, exceeded, and 4.1 parts per million when that target was achieved. So you had almost an order of magnitude difference between when our general exhaust ventilation requirements uh, were met compared to when they were exceeded. And you can see some salons uh, were doing great. And these were the more high-end salons. You know, they were meeting that requirement. Their TVOC concentration were really, really small throughout the day uh, compared to salons that never really met that target. You had some pretty high concentrations in there. So like this first salon here, uh, for mo most of the day, you know, they were not meeting that ventilation requirement and their TVOC concentrations at the time were 46 parts per million and you know, had a peak of 67 parts per million. So after we conducted that initial study, uh, in about a year later, uh, we conducted a follow-up study. And really, well, you know, what we want to do with this follow-up study was answer questions that, you know, were generated the first study. You know, I think, you know, one of the big limitations from that first study was we only measured concentrations over one single weekday. You know? uh, we don't really see how that exposure varied throughout the week. Uh, secondly, the lack of chemical-specific uh, sampling, okay? So we measured TVOC concentrations, but we didn't measure uh, any other uh, type of exposure in there. So for this one, we measured concentrations over three consecutive days, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, as well as we measured individual uh, chemicals in there, uh, methyl uh, methacrylate, uh, toluene, and ethyl acetate. Uh, we selected those chemicals. Uh, one, uh, methyl methacrylate is a sensitizer. Uh, and workers could potentially have to self-select out of the industry if they become a sensitive uh, to that. Uh, toluene, uh, it's a reproductive toxin. There's also been a big campaign to uh, you know, remove toluene as part of the toxic trio and you know, have that uh, you know, removed from any sort of nail uh, polish. Interestingly, I was reviewing uh, safety data sheets from uh, like, you know, probably the 1990s, so almost 30 years ago. Toluene was used in, you know, a fairly substantial amount in nail polish. Um, you know, as I found in this study, you know, we did 
really detect toluene. Uh, but you know, 20, 30 years ago, this was used in a large, like you know, one to you know five percent of nail polish was toluene. So that was interesting uh, to see, and to see the you know the work that was done to uh, make people aware of it and have that attitude out of nail products. Uh, and additionally, uh, you know, we want to look at the outdoor airflow rates. Uh, so we measured CO2 in this, uh, this study. So, you know, same problems with recruitment. Uh, we, you know, went to about 300 nail salons in 2018, recruited 12 this time. So in order to measure uh, the individual goals, uh, the MMA, toluene, and ethyl acetate, uh, we used a passive sampler to measure that daily exposure. Uh, so we used the Radiella passive monitor. Now I selected this uh, monitor specifically because it had a low limit of detection. Uh, additionally, it had a longer stability compared to other uh, commercial passive monitors. Now, I will warn you, as uh, practicing hygienists that are attending this, um, we were going to initially do the analysis ourselves, but we had some problems with our instruments. So we sent these off to a commercial lab. The vast majority of commercial labs have not developed methods for this type of sampler. So it cost a lot of money, more money than we initially had planned for uh, in order to analyze these samplers. So, you know, it did offer, I thought, some good benefits, but when I actually had to send it to a commercial lab, uh, because some problems I had with our own instrumentation, uh, I somewhat regret selecting these samplers. Now, for this study, what we would have is you have a diffusive you can see on the left side. Uh, so basically you put in the passive sampler into that diffusive body, uh, you screwed on to this stand and worker, or excuse me, the nail salon uh, manager would record when they uh, started the sampler, uh, when they took the sampler out and put it into this plastic tube at the end of the day. Uh, so basically, you know, time on, time off, so we can get the concentration. We would also ask the manager to Board uh, the number of manicures and pedicures that they performed each day. Now, I will say, you know, initially when we designed this, we had uh, written up some methods for them. Uh, we would, you know, remind them the first day, and then, you know, we did this Thursday and Saturday. Um, we just assumed that they would comply uh, with this method. The first two salons went fine. Uh, on three and four uh, forgot to do this. So we changed up our methods after salon four to send twice daily reminders via text message to you know, remind them to take, uh, you know, put the sampler in the, uh, in the beginning of the day and stop it at the end of the day. All the direct reading instruments would just be plugged in and run continuously. So that wasn't uh, part of the manager's duty, but this was. So uh, as I said before, mainly uh, for this study, uh, we're located in Manhattan, uh, but we did almost have an even distribution between Manhattan and Brooklyn. Now, I would say in our first study, you know, so almost, I would say about 16,000 uh, uh, square feet, or excuse me, uh, cubic feet. Uh, salons were roughly about half in this study. So again, I think much more indicative of uh, nail salons in New York uh, City. Now, this, it wanted to try to further evaluate, okay, not just are they meeting that general exhaust ventilation target, but are they, you know, complying with the law? Okay. The law, remember, was you must exhaust all day, um, and your uh, exhaust must be good side. So of the 12 salons that we recruited, uh, five actually used their exhaust all day. Uh, salons had no uh, exhaust, you know, so they just would use natural ventilation in the summer with fans, 
and then you know uh, some sort of heating in the okay? so they were absolutely not complying with the law other people said that they would turn the ventilation on and off throughout the day if um, the odors bothered them but they were all day and finally only five salons of the ten that had ventilation systems uh, exhausted directly outdoors uh, work related and forewarned sure I think the takeaway message for me uh, on this was most managers do not know how their ventilation system works. And I think as public health professionals, you know, we really do need to do better education, educating the owners and the managers, you know, how to actually use these controls, how to use them effectively, because, you know, they're not trained in that. Um, so when I designed the study, I thought we'd have much greater, you know, variability in the measurements, number of customers. Uh, I probably should have selected maybe a Wednesday instead of Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in the summertime. Uh, as you can see, uh, the number of customers in the salons were pretty uniform. So we didn't really have a big amount of variability, um, even though we selected three different days. So you know, it's summertime, people are off more. Um, so in retrospect, we probably should have chose different days to capture both your high exposure and low level exposure. So again, you know, that lack, this is a mean across the 12 salon, I'll break it down by the salon, um, the next slide. But just as a mean uh, for all the salons, again, not a whole lot of ability in the TDOC concentrations throughout Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, same with CO2. Now, clean was only detected in three salons over that, uh, you know, three consecutive days. So only in three salons. Uh, interesting a lot, interestingly enough, uh, when we recorded the types of products they use, they use similar uh, manufacturer products. So there are small amounts of toluene in those products that they were using. Uh, but overall, low levels of ex exposure. So it looks like you know, the health campaign to try to eliminate toluene uh, from nail project products is working. Um, Methylmethacrylate, you know, sensitizer, we want to make sure that's not in the products. We only found that uh, in a few salons as well. Also very levels um, detected. Ethyl acetates used in a wide variety of nail products and we found that in basically almost every salon over almost every day. Again, you know, about three orders of magnitude lower than your TLV, uh, but we did we readily did detect that. Now, this goes back to, you know, that the, you know, overall objective of this study, you know, looking at new public health law, okay? So, of the 12 salons that we uh, sampled from, only three salons that general exhaust ventilation required. Like I said in the beginning, no salons met the local exhaust ventilation requirement, but three salons did. So, they had a exhaust directly outside, um, they uh, use their exhaust all day and they met the 25 CFM per person. So in these three compliance salons, they actually averaged the most amount of customers. So they had 85 customers compared to your non-compliance salons of 38 customers. Okay, so almost three times the amount of customers. They were larger. Um, and the exposures, we measured 16 uh, parts per million uh, average over those days compared to almost 40 parts per million in your non-compliant salons. And in these compliant salons, about, uh, you know, 37 CFM per person compared to 14. Uh, these two salons did not have ventilation systems and just opened their windows, compliant with the law, but very low exposures and, you know, obviously met that outdoor airflow. So it works well now in summertime, but in winter you might have a different story. 
So overall, you can see an exposure you know, profile throughout the day. This was in a non compliant salon. So they averaged about 1,800 uh, parts per million of CO2. Uh, so I think that's about 4 CFM of outdoor air per person. And the overall exposure in there was about 75 ppm of TVOCs. So you saw, you know, almost a steady state achieved uh, both for the CO2 and TVOCs throughout the day. Um, so you basically can go sample time and you get, you know, the same exposure measurements throughout the day. Um, this salon, the manager was unsure whether or not they there uh, all day and didn't know if it was recirculated or ducted outside. Uh, this salon didn't meet our CFM requirements, but you can see, um, you know, they didn't, they gradually increased their CO2 emissions. You saw a greater variability in the amount of TVOCs, um, you know, probably from localized sources. So you can see a increase, decrease um, in that. Uh, I don't know if it's from, you know, the you know, closing of the source or maybe the uh, front you know, the door of the salon opening, but you do see a, uh, a pattern of increase and decay in the TVOC concentrations. But overall, you know, like I said, they didn't beat that 25 CA per person throughout the day. Um, and their overall TVOC concentration was around, I think about, you know, 20. So, you know, the overall general conclusions of this is, um, you know, we visited over 300 salons in those two days. Again, not one salon had installed the local exhaust ventilation system. Only 25 of the sal percent of the salons met the general exhaust requirements. So we have a ways to go in terms of implementing this public health law in New York, you know, uh, city in New York state. Um, and then, you know, a lot of that goes back to we're not doing a very good job uh, training the managers to understand their ventilation system and how to control the exposure. Um, also, in uh, terms of you know implementing this public health law, we have thousand salons in New York City alone. You know, how are uh, compliance workers going to go in there and check to make sure that they're meeting this outdoor airflow requirement? And be just based on the schematics. Um, like I said, I had a lot of problems, you know, measuring that outdoor airflow. So they need to have some sort of methodology in that. <laughs> in terms of the ex exposure conclusions, you know, what I found was a salon has poor indoor air quality is going to have that poor indoor air quality, you know, all the days I measure. Okay, salons with good indoor air quality was going to have good indoor air quality throughout those three days we measured. Um, salons with good air quality had, you know, met those general exhaust ventilation requirements. Salons that didn't, um, you know, did not meet those raw requirements. So, you know, we know obviously these ventilation requirements work. It's up to, you know, public health professionals to go out and educate the managers and owners about using it. Uh, they can, you know, reduce that exposure within nail salons because we know workers are getting sick. Uh, once the nail salons actually do install the local exhaust ventilation zones, you know, we, you, we're going to see even greater improvement in indoor air quality. So again, you know, it's looking at the hierarchy of controls here, you know, reducing nail technicians exposure is going to be a multifaceted approach. You know, we saw that, you know, toluene has substantially been reduced, um, you know, through those campaigns. Uh, we're seeing lower levels from the engineering controls. Uh, so we are, you know, using this you know, approach to really help improve exposures within the nail salons. And I just want to acknowledge uh, everyone worked on, uh, worked with on these studies and the New York, New Jersey ERC pilot project that uh, funded part of this research. Uh, so I think I've about 10 minutes left, so I can take questions now.
Wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, at this time, if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the online Q&A box. I'm happy to read them aloud. Um, you actually already answered our first question. It was, what is a nail salon hierarchy? Um, so if the individual who asked that question, um, if you wanted any more specific information about that, you're more than welcome to um, ask a follow-up question. Um, we have another question. Um, did any consumer complaints, for example, odor, help drive the New York State requirements? Um, I'm sure. Uh, my understanding was a lot of the New York State uh, requirements were driven by the New York uh, Times articles that seemed to, um, you know, capture the public and really spurred those changes in the uh, requirements in nail salons. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question also specifically on the New York law and whether it recommends a filter on the exhaust ventilation and how do they recommend dealing with dust as an issue? Yeah, I have not seen that. Uh, and it's a good question. Obviously, we want to avoid bringing dust in our ventilation system. Um, reading the regulations, and again, uh, you know, I, I, I could be incorrect, but I did not see any sort of requirements for a filter um, at the exhaust or what to do with dust. Um, so I did not see that specifically within the new state requirements. Um, again, I can always go back and maybe look at that, but I did not see that when I went through them. Thank you. All right, we have oop, a bunch more questions just came in. Thank you, everyone. Um, the sum of three compounds you measured comprise a small fraction of the total VOCs measured. Do you have any idea of what those other volatile compounds may be? Uh, yeah. Uh, so this was um, a compilation of, sorry. So this was uh, what's been measured previously in exposure and studies. Uh, so you can see, you know, we were definitely with you know the TVOC concentration that are the PID, you know we were probably underestimating concentrations in there, um, mainly because we were not capturing the alcohols and acetones, and that's going to be primarily what the exposure was comprised of, um, and we did not measure that. But so yeah, you know the majority of the exposure in there was making up the TVOC concentrations, acetone and alcohol. Okay, thank you. Um, and what was your general observation regarding respiratory protection? Um, did you see that there were different types being used or it was being used properly? Yeah, so any respiratory protection I saw was surgical masks. So, you know, there's no respiratory protection I was seeing that dealt with vapors. Um, so I did not see any, any type of respiratory protection outside of surgical masks. Thank you. Um, kind of a similar question. Should nail salons have some side of some sort of basic safety health and program? Basic safety and health program. I mean, I, I think so. Um, just like I said, I mean, I think the literature is very consistent with uh, both self-reported symptoms and more ob objective measurements. Nail salon workers are experiencing uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, dermal exposures. Um, they're, you know, working with chemicals for eight to 10 days, six, seven days a week. So, you know, there should be some sort of health and safety program. It's challenging uh, due to just language barriers. Um, you know, it, 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 I think it's hard, you know, you don't have workers that maybe have industrial hygiene background, you know, to have a health and safety manager there. Uh, but I really do think there should be some sort of, you know, health and safety training for all workers. Um, and so on being mindful of the exposures in the salon. Great, thank you. Um, and one of our participants also added um, hazard communication programs and respiratory protection programs um, to be included with the idea of a safety program. Sure, uh, I think in terms of the respiratory protection, it's, it's gonna be difficult because, I mean, how we're for exposure. So are we gonna have vapor respirators required uh, that the nail salon workers are aware, who's going to do the fit testing, you know, so I'd be challenging to implement 
respiratory protection, uh, probably the best is you know, the local and general exhaust ventilation systems working in combination and substituting out the, you know, most toxic chemicals workers are exposed to. Great, thank you. Um, and do you know, do you see these recommendations or requirements being implemented in other states? Oh yeah, there's a few other states. I know Boston, or not in a state, but the city um, had implemented those regulations. And I'm sure there's a few other um, cities and states that have, I don't know off the top of my head, Boston specifically had implemented very similar requirements. And that was successful in Boston. But I think Boston only had 100 nail salons and a pretty big public health program. Well, we have 2,000 nail salons. So it comes down to the education and then enforcement. How are we going to achieve that? Great, thank you. Um, and I appreciate all, we have lots of really great questions in the chat Q&A. Um, I think we have time for a couple of more. So my apologies if we don't get to your question, um, but we'll, we'll do our best here. <laughs> um, do you see any industry movement towards substituting chemicals, for example, those with lower VOC levels? Uh, you know, I, I'm not up to date on that. So I don't, I don't know, really know about tree movement. Uh, in, so I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't answer that. Okay, no problem. Um, and someone noted that eyewash squeeze bottles were in the wall, on the wall in one of the photos. And they were wondering about reluctance to participate, if it ha might have any relation to experience with OSHA inspections, or if you had heard anything about that while you were um, okay. visiting your salons. Uh, yeah, I've never seen an eyewash bottle. I, I pulled probably all those photos from New York State uh, they produced like a pamphlet on, you know, the requirements in the salon. So that might be, you know, kind of ID from New York state In all the salons I visited, I've never seen an eyewash bottle. I mean, again, it could be in maybe the, uh, an area I'm not, you know, going in, but I, I never saw any sort of, um, eyewash bottle. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Very much appreciate it. Um, and to our learners, um, we will be posting the recording of this webinar on our website and also on our YouTube page. Um, and we also, I was able to find the full text article um, and I will be sharing that on our website along with the video as well if you're interested in reading that full text article that was published. Um, a special thank you to Dr. Pavlanas, as well as everyone who joined us for today's webinar. This series takes place the second Tuesday of each month and is in addition to our ERC ergonomics webinar series, which is the third Wednesday of each month. Our next industrial hygiene webinar is going to be on Tuesday, September 8th on IH pilot studies, current research in food truck exposure and customized PPE. And that is being done in partnership with the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety. We also have an online class starting next Monday, August 17th, Foundations for Cognitive, Macro, and Physical Human Factors and Ergonomics. Be sure to check out our website for more information and to register for upcoming events at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Thank you all so much for your wonderful questions and participation in today's webinar. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much for having me.